So I want to discuss today the, the second enemy of the three that we're going to look at, the second home and place and origin of the lies that we believe and the things that tear us apart and the, 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 those who are opposed to truth. So last week we first talked about the human heart and how it is inherently opposed to truth and how it, it itself can lie to us and rip us apart from the inside out and make us believe things and conjure up all kinds of evil things and convince us of them. The heart within us. And today we talk about the second enemy of three. Like I said, we're talking about the world. The world. And so before I start, I just want to introduce and, and remind you of something we talked about last week that we started. That God is a God of truth, period. He is not associated with lies or mistruths or deception in any way at all. Everything he does, he says, is True. He loves the truth with everything in him and he hates lies. So God is a God of truth. Therefore, we can assume that anything that is opposed to him deals only in lies. Anything that is opposed to God deals only in lies and is also opposed to truth. Okay, If something is opposed to God, it's opposed to truth, period. And it knows nothing of the real truth because Jesus Christ is truth. First, er, John 14, 6, for I am the way, the truth, and the life. And all truth comes from the mouth and heart of God. And today we talk about those outside of the church, outside of the body of Christ, those who are opposed to God, what the Bible in the New Testament especially refers to as the world. And so I want to read this first verse to us and we can can start from there. 1 John chapter 3 verse 1. So what kind of love the Father has given us that we should be called children of God? And so we are. The reason why the world does not know us is that it did not know him. So, so watch this flow of logic. It says in 1 John 3, 1, that the world does not know us because, because why? Because it did not know him, him being Jesus Christ. So the world does not know truth, okay? It does not know Christ, I mean, sorry. And so here's the flow of logic. Because God is truth and because the world does not know God, the world does not know truth, okay? One, two, three. Do you see? God is truth. The world does not know God. In conclusion, the world does not know truth. In fact, the world around us, those who are not in Christ, are actively opposed to the truth, right? In their hearts, right? Their hearts lie to them, and from the lies in their heart come lies from their mouths to others, right? They are being lied to inside of themselves, and therefore all they can usher out is lies because they're not being filled with truth at all because truth is not in them. And so the world is actively opposed to truth. Therefore, right, if that's true, We should never believe what it says about us or obey what it tells us to do, right? For example, what we just witnessed in the chat and what's happening still now, people saying this lie that that Christians are colonizers and that mission trips are, are colonization, right? I don't have to believe what the world says about that because the world doesn't know truth. And I shouldn't be shocked when the world says things that I know to be untrue because I am familiar with the truth. Because the world has no clue what the truth actually is. So we should not believe what the world says about us because the world is going to say all kinds of evil, unjust, terrible things about you. Simply because it can. Right? And they're going, they're going to say hurtful, painful things about us. Right? Right? And so we should not believe what the world says about us or believe what it tells us to do because the world would have us do a lot of things that would cause us to disobey God. The world commands us to behave in in specific ways. The world commands us to, to do what it says. But because the world doesn't know truth, because the world doesn't know what's right, we should not listen to what the world tells us to do. But we do. We do. We do listen to what the world says to do. And here's, here's why that's dumb. Okay, we're going to talk about what it is that I think that causes us to believe what the world says and to obey the world. But let's first establish why that's dumb. Okay? Right? Okay. So why is it dumb to listen to what, and I'm using the word dumb because it's, it's a simple word. I don't want to say it's foolish or anything. It's dumb. And I know that's not like a super eloquent, nice, happy word, but it's the one that makes the most sense. It's dumb. Like, in, 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 you critically think about this, and it's like, oh, okay. So the world doesn't know what it's talking about, and yet I'm going to listen to everything it says about me and respect it as truth. It's like, oh, so that's dumb. And we all know that that's dumb, right? To believe what the world says about us or obey what it tells you to do. I don't want to use a prettier word because I think that gets the point across. So here's a few verses that are about the world and about wisdom and about truth, and I want just to take them in 
and allow them to show us why it's dumb to believe the world and obey what it says. Proverbs 1.7, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge or the beginning of wisdom. It says all over Proverbs, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, is the beginning of wisdom. And we've talked about what the fear of the Lord actually means before. And we can say with certainty along that definition, the world does not fear God. It does not revere him or trust him. So they haven't even confronted the beginning of knowledge. They haven't even taken the first step into wisdom. They know nothing. They are totally empty of knowledge and truth and wisdom. They know nothing because they do not fear God. 1 Corinthians 3.19, For the wisdom of this world is folly with God. All over the word, it teaches that there, is, that there is worldly wisdom and godly wisdom. There are people in this world who would say that they are wise and that we would look at them and say that they are wise, but they don't know Christ, therefore that cannot be wisdom, right? We, we think that they know what they're doing, but how clever, how wise, how smart, how together can someone have it? How, how wise can they be? If it seems like they have everything and understand everything, yet still do not know Christ. When he is the cornerstone, he's the baseline, he is the utmost need of all humanity. How well and how wisely must they have considered their surroundings and themselves to conclude that they do not need Jesus? How wise can they be? And that's because the wisdom of this world is folly, is foolishness to God. Because God says that his ways are not our ways, his thoughts are not our thoughts. He's at the next level, he's in an entirely different plane of thinking and doing. And so we may say that people are wise. But what is the standard, right? Is it compared to the man next to him or is it compared to the almighty eternal God? And lastly, John eleven ten. 10. But if anyone walks in the night, he stumbles because the light is not in him. That's the world right there. Like, I could just stop the message. The John 11.10, these people are stumbling around in the darkness trying to figure out where they're going with their hands, right? Just none of their senses are valuable. All they can do is feel around and try and figure out they're going, where they're going, or their next move. They're completely clueless, and they pretend like they know what they're doing, like the blind leading the blind, the Bible says, right? They paint a picture of confidence, of knowledge, of strength. But they are blind men walking around in the dark and have no clue where their next step will go. That's the reality. That is the world. That is those outside of Christ. Wandering. It says he stumbles. And so that's why. That's why we said, look at that. They, they don't fear the Lord, so they're not, they haven't even begun to have knowledge or wisdom. Right? That God himself says that their wisdom is folly and they are stumbling around in the dark. So that's why we can say it's dumb of us. It's not an insult. It's not a criticism because I do the same thing. But we are silly. right? We are foolish when we believe the things, the lies that the world has to say about us and obey what it tells us to do. Because according to the scripture, what we just read, the world is winging it. Like they are just figuring it out as they go have no course of action, no plan, they, just no idea, figuring it out as they go. Whereas the church, the body of Christ, the people, the children of God, it says we have eternal guidance, divine guidance and intervention. And so who should we listen to, right? Like God is a God of truth. He knows everything. He can do anything. He's eternal, he's infinite, he's divine. So should we listen to him, right? Should we believe what he says and obey what he says, or should we look at the world, which is opposed to truth, which has not even begun to have wisdom, which God himself claims to be folly and foolish, the, the world that is stumbling in the darkness, which one are we going to choose to believe? Right? Right? Like when we, when we follow the world, we're talking about being under or led by someone who knows even less than you do. 
but submitting ourselves to them and existing below them. Because we're the people of the light. And we say, no, but I'm going to listen what the guy in the dark says to do. I can see, like, listen, I can see 50 yards ahead. But this blind guy, this blind guy says I should go this way, even though I see mines all across the ground, right? But I'm going to listen to him, and I'm going to go this way. Like, does that make any sense at all? No, of course not. You see a big sign, hey, my, caution, mine's ahead. And the blind guy's like, I'm pretty sure we should go this way. And you know he's blind. And you look at him and say, yeah, I trust you. Even though you have eyes that can see, you are surrounded by the light of Christ. Like, what are you doing? And that's what we do. Why? <laughs> like, why? It seems so obvious that we shouldn't believe them or listen to them. So why do we do it in the first place? There are four reasons I, four reasons I want to talk about. There's four. And there are things that we lack. So the first one. We lack discernment. Discernment is the ability to, 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 ju to judge. But in the Christian sense, it's judging whether or not something is from God, right? So can we discern? Can we look at everything around us and the things that come toward us and look at them and say, is this from God? Is this true, right? The problem is that we lack discernment and we are so quick to believe what we are told. We do the same thing with our heart as we do with the world. We hear these lies we hear them and we just believe them because they kind of make sense to us because we've heard those things in the past because our, our, our past has confirmed those lies. And so we just say, yeah, I'll believe that. That must be true about me. And we believe what the world is saying about us. Oftentimes because we are so scared to judge, but I'm telling you right now, discern, judge. When people say things, don't just say, well, I don't, I don't know about it. And judge. Not an A, I'm better than you. Not that kind of judging. It's not what I mean. I mean, look at what they're saying and, and weigh the scales. Is this true? Is this false? Right? If you hear something before you agree with it and decide that it's truth, confirm it. There's a great example of this in the New Testament. It's the Bereans in Acts chapter 17. Here's what it says in verses 10 and 11. The brothers immediately sent Paul and Silas away by night to Berea. And when they arrived, they went into the Jewish synagogue. Now these Jews were more noble than those in Thessalonica. They received the word with all eagerness, examining the scriptures daily to see if, this thing, if these things were so. so. So here's what Paul and Silas go to visit these Jews in Berea, and they preach to them the gospel of Jesus Christ. And you know what these, these men do? They don't just say, no, that's wrong, or no, that's true. They go to the Old Testament scriptures, and they open the Old Testament and read the books of prophecy. They read them and compare them with what is being told them, to told to them by Paul and Silas about the gospel and compare to know if it's true. And it says in verse 12 that many of them believed, many of them became saved because they confirmed that it was true. But look, had they gone into that word and found that it said something totally contrary to what Paul was teaching them, they would not have believed and they would have said it is false, right? Because they look at the source of truth and they compare it to the source of whatever they're hearing and lay them side by side. And if they don't look the same, then they can say that is wrong. That's why the Bible tells us to store the word in our heart, to keep it hidden here. So that when I hear things, I have this truth. So, so I'm so filled with truth. Right? That I almost just have this, this sword, which is clever that the Bible is called a sword. Wow, it's like almost like this analogy works great. But it's you, you have this sword to just like sort of chop at everything that comes through. And when you're swinging it around and wielding the word of God as a sword, the only blows that pass through are truthful. It's the truth that we let by. And we don't defend against it because we can consume the truth. And so we lack discernment. Partly because we don't care. Right? We don't have the effort to just find out if something is true and we just take it and believe it. Partly because we believe it before we even hear it. Right? Like oftentimes these lies that we hear are already confirming things we believe. And so we don't want to discern. I don't want to know that that, that thing is false because it's easier. It's more comfortable. I'm so used to this lie. I don't want to believe it's false. I want to stay here in my contentment and in my comfort. So the world tells, says, tells us and says lies about us, and we believe them because we're already lying to ourselves about those things. And that, that can go in all kinds of ways, right? You could take that the, the sort of progressive Christian route, 
We're not, you're, you're sort of lying to yourself about sin and saying that it's okay. And when, and when the world comes to us and says, yeah, it is okay. In fact, it's great. In fact, I love that about you, that it's sin. Then we, we sort of just go, hmm. So may, maybe this is good. And I don't need to confirm because this is what I wanted to hear. Right? We have this sort of confirmation bias. And we say, I don't need to discern. I don't need to seek the truth anymore. Because someone... Not someone reliable, just someone said something that I already believed and it confirmed what I thought. And so now this thing is cemented in for me, but can also come in more harmful ways, right? Like, like you can believe something horrible about yourself. Like you could believe, you could believe that you're not good enough. And I don't mean in the sense where you can say like, okay, you can't be good enough for God. I mean, I mean, for the people around you, like, like people eventually are going to, are, are going to stop loving you, right? You could believe that lie about yourself. That you're unlovable. That's, that's a good one. That you can believe that you're unlovable. And we become so, so content with that pain and so used to that lie that when someone around us comes and says, yeah, that's true, or proves that lie to us, we don't need to discern and say, no, I am lovable. No, 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 because this confirms what I've been thinking all along. That's what I wanted to hear, which sounds counterintuitive. And it sounds like no one would do that, right? No one would want to believe something that's inherently harmful, but we do it all the time. We do it all the time. And so I urge you to discern, judge, don't take, don't let anything slip by you, right? If anyone ever says, just period, in life, if you hear anything or read anything before you let it sit and fester and become truth in your mind and in your heart, look at it and assess whether or not this thing is true. Discern, judge. So that's the first thing. Number two, we lack biblical accountability. This is the reality. You need to surround yourself with people who know the truth. Right? Have a circle of people who know the truth. Let those who lead you in life be led by Christ. If anyone is leading you or teaching you or guiding you or giving you wisdom or it's even just little advice, the person you hit up when you're sad, let that person be someone who is led by Christ because worldly people are going to give worldly advice and Christ-like people are going to give Christ-like advice. And that's how that goes. And we've already seen that the world doesn't know what it's talking about. And so there are two kinds of accountability and counsel that are wrong, that are wrong. And why neither of them should look like your life. First is bad counsel. 1 Corinthians 15, 33. Do not be deceived. Bad company ruins good morals. I use this story all the time, but the story of Rehoboam, the son of Solomon. Here's what happened to Rehoboam. Solomon, super wise, and he sort of fell off towards the end there. And because of his mistakes... Right? God was like, okay, well, I'm going to let you be king for the rest of your life, but when you die, I'm going to split up the kingdom, and I'm, gonna, I'm just going to, your house will no longer be king over all of Israel as it was before because of this mistake. And so Rehoboam comes, comes into office, and, and Solomon, in his wisdom, had established a group of very, very wise counselors to help the king, okay? And Solomon had warned his sons, okay, like, if you become king, like, if and when you become king, okay? You need to make sure you listen to these counsel of guys because they know what they're doing. And so there's this division in Israel, right? And the people are like Rehoboam, like your, your father, he treated us so poorly. It's, it's, like, it's like forced labor. And he's like, it was so hard. Like, what are you going to do? And the wise people are like, no, you should like make it up to them. You should, you should be kind to them, answer with grace. And he says, well, I'm, I'm not really sure if I like that answer. And so he goes to his group of young men who had no experience, who had no idea what they're doing, just his friends. What do, you, what do you guys think I should do? Here's what they said. And wanting to please the king, they said, you know what, you should go to them and be harsh. You should tell them, you know what, my father was bad, but I'm going to double it. I'm going to make things so much harder for you. And that's what he does. And he goes to the people and they go, they, they just sort of, um, yeah, they, I don't want you to be my king. And the, boom, just like that, the nation splits and they begin to follow a man named Jeroboam. And Rehoboam is left with two of the kingdoms of Israel. And just like that, because Rehoboam decided to believe poor counsel, bad counsel, massive consequences happened. Massive consequences. And his throne was basically ruined. And so the kind of accountability that you don't want is bad counsel, is selfish counsel, is counsel that is not inherently influenced by God and his Holy Spirit. Right? You want Christ-led leaders, Christ-led counsel and accountability. 
the people that are pouring into you and teaching you and guiding you and helping you and giving you advice. Let those be people who are hearing from the word of God and are led by Christ. And the second kind of counsel you need to avoid is no counsel at all. That is almost more dangerous than bad counsel. Proverbs eleven fourteen, where there is no guidance, a people falls. But in an abundance of counselors, there is safety. This is Solomon talking to his sons about, about being a king someday. Right? That's why he says a people falls. Like everyone under you will fall as well if you choose not to have guidance and counsel. If you choose not to be led by other people as well and, and helped along the way and given wisdom and advice, you will affect everyone around you. So he says, where there is no guidance, a, people's fall, a people falls. But in an abundance of counselors, there is safety. If you are the one who is left to correct every lie, every single lie, you are the one who has to yourself take in everything that you're hearing and decide at, at every single one of those statements that you, that you read or hear and say, this is truth, this is lies. You will not succeed. And we established that last week. We already established that your heart cannot be trusted all the time. It can't be. And so though there may be times you succeed in tearing down the lies and recognizing the truth, there will be many, many times that you fail because your heart loves deception. Your heart loves lies. And so you need people around you who are also fighting against lies that can point out in your life when the lies rise up. That's what community is. When my brother is being lied to by his heart or by the world or by the enemy that we'll talk about next week, um, when he's being lied to, I point it out and fill him with the truth. You need people who can do the same. People who are so familiar with the truth and equip it and are equipped with it so well that when you are being lied to, they shoot down those lies themselves with the truth that they know and remind you what your God says about you. That's the second reason we lack accountability. The third reason we lack courage or boldness, right? We, we fear the world because we lack trust in God. We're scared of the world. We are intimidated by the world, by the people in power, by, by, by the popular people, by, by cancel culture. We, we, we are afraid. Here's, here's what the word of God says, Hebrews 13, 5 and 6. For he has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. So we can confidently say, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear. What can man do to me? John 16, 33. I have said these things to you that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but take heart. I have overcome the world. Take heart. Be bold. Right? If you can stand with boldness in the presence of God, soaked in the blood of Christ, then who can you not stand in front of boldly? Right? If God says, you can stand boldly in front of me, how offensive is it then for us to be insecure or, 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 or afraid or in our heads when we're, in, when we're in front of other people that aren't Him? What do we say about God if we're willing to stand boldly in front of Him, but not in front of the world? The fourth reason, lastly, we lack integrity. And what I mean by this is that we are people pleasers. We're people pleasers. And so I want to give you two examples in the New Testament of people who were possibly led. Right? They were tempted towards people pleasing. And there's a group, there's there's some that gave the wrong response and some that gave the right response. So we see in John 12, as Jesus is teaching. Here's what it says in verse 42 and 43. Nevertheless, many, even of the authorities, believed in him. But for fear of the Pharisees, they did not confess, so, they would, so that they would not be put out of the synagogue. For they love the glory that comes from man more than the glory that comes from God. For fear of the Pharisees. They feared the Pharisees more than they feared Jesus Christ, the Messiah. Because they did not want to be put out of the synagogue. They didn't want to face the consequences of defying the world and following Christ. For they love the glory that comes from man more than the glory that comes from God. Which glory do you love more? Romans 2.29 teaches that those who have a changed heart love, the, love to please God, right? They love, when, they love the approval of God more than the approval of man. And we'll talk about exactly why that is in a moment. But I first want to show you a good example of someone who was tempted towards people pleasing and decided to be to have integrity and to be firm and stand upon the rock. This is Acts 5:29. 
This is Peter and John standing before the Pharisees, before the authorities. And they're basically like, you need to stop preaching. You need to stop saying these things about Christ. But Peter and the apostles answered, we must obey God rather than man. And there it is. Because, you know why? Because they love the glory that comes from God more than the glory that comes from man. And they were not concerned with being put out of the synagogue because they were already temples of the Holy Spirit. And so they had integrity and they stood in firmness. And so as I close, I just want to establish to you quickly why it is so much harder to please the world than it is to please God. So much harder to please the world. And that's why God's approval feels so much better. It's because the world is constantly changing, right? Changing its mind and telling us we need something different. And no one in the world believes the same thing. You can't find any one person who believes that you should do the same thing as another person believes. Right? Everyone wants something different from you. And they're constantly changing their minds. And they're asking far too much of you. Setting you to an impossible standard that they do not meet themselves. Right? That's what the world does. One day the world wants this and the next day it wants this and it's changing. You have to keep trying to fit to its standard to be enough for the world, to please the world, to have the world love you. But here's what God says. God says, I established what I wanted from you before you even existed. And that that desire, right, that will for you has not changed at all. It's, It's actually easier to please God than it is to please man. And that sounds crazy. That sounds crazy. But in pleasing the world, you have no help. But in pleasing God, you have God himself to carry most of the weight for you and guide you in his will, right? And he's not changing what his will is for you. He just says, obey, right? Love me and pursue holiness. So who does it sound like it's harder to please? The God of truth who's never going to change his mind about you or the world of lies? that cannot decide in any moment what it wants from you. So this is what we say, resist the world. And and, and that's what it says in 1 John 3.13, do not be surprised when the world hates you. And Jesus teaches that same thing in the book of John, that, that the world hated him first. So do not be surprised when it hates you. Because you're full of the truth. And you are meant to be a mirror and an image of the truth to the world around you. And when the, when the truth hits people who hate the truth, they're going to be opposed to it. But stand firm. Because living in the truth, freedom in truth is better than slavery to lies. Living in the truth is better than submitting to lies and deception. So choose to follow God and believe what He says about you, right? Have discernment, have accountability, have boldness and courage, and have integrity. And don't believe the things this world wants you to believe.